So uh, our next speaker is James Choi from the Yale School of Management, and uh, he will tell us about uh, creating decision cues. Thank you. I see there's no clicker. Actually, there was a clicker, wasn't there? Oh, I it think you want to Oh, I see. It was, it was your private uh, <laughs> communal property. OK, well, it's a real pleasure to be here to talk about creating decision cues to influence behavior. So this slide shows a really uh, simplified, greatly simplified conceptualization of how somebody goes, uh, kind of arrives at an action. So you first have to recognize that a situation is kind of appropriate for a genre of action. You might have just changed a job, so your economic situation has changed. So this is an appropriate time to maybe revisit your finances and choose a different savings rate, a different asset allocation in your portfolio. And then you actually have to choose the action. So what exactly is your savings rate going to be? What exactly is your asset allocation going to be? And then finally, you need to implement that action. And what we've been learning is that moving down this chain is actually costly for people. And so just like electricity seeks out the path of least resistance as it moves from point A to point B, people uh, and their choices are kind of inclined towards the path of least resistance uh, uh, in, in kind of their day-to-day -day living. And often the path of least resistance is to do absolutely nothing. And therefore, what we have been discovering as policymakers, as institutional designers, is that we can harness and channel that inertia to affect outcomes by changing exactly what is implemented when somebody chooses to do nothing. In other words, we can change the default option, and that's something that I've studied quite a bit in uh, my previous work. But you know, there are a lot of situations where we are just not in a position to change the default. It, you know, we just can't say that if you do nothing, if you choose nothing, then the next thing you know, you're going to be having a colonoscopy. You know, at least we, you know, we shouldn't be able to do such things. And so uh, what I want to talk about today is a different set of interventions that really focus on the uh, first two links in this chain kind of recognizing that a situation is appropriate for a genre of action, and then uh, cueing a certain action that is going to take place. And so the first genre of interventions I'm going to talk about are implementation intention prompts, which move you along uh, those first two links in the chain. And I'll say more about what implementation intention prompts are uh, in a few, couple minutes. And then I'll talk about a series of interventions just on the second link in that chain. I'm going to call those action cues that uh, make certain actions uh, more salient. And we're not going to uh, focus so much on the first link in the chain when we are implementing action cues. Now, when I think about psychological uh, interventions that affect choices meaningfully in the real world, I think there are four characteristics that uh, would be really desirable for these interventions to, to have. First, the intervention should work outside of the laboratory. So I think it's one thing for a certain psychological lever or treatment to work in a controlled laboratory setting. And it's another thing for that intervention to work in the messiness of everyday life. Second, uh, we would like this intervention to affect important, meaningful behaviors. Let's face it, a lot of the laboratory studies that we see in journals uh, study outcomes and behaviors that quite honestly, are a little trivial. And so, you know, that can be great for uh, illuminating certain psychological processes, because uh, the particular behavior we're studying, studying really just uh, it, it quite, quite cleanly isolates a, a particular pathway. But now if we want to apply those lessons to the real world, it takes a leap of extrapolation to say, you know, this 
particular lever affects this trivial behavior. Therefore, it must also affect this really meaningful uh, substantive behavior. And so we want to be able to establish that link directly uh, through evidence rather than doing the extrapolation. Third, the manipulation or the treatment has to feel natural to people outside the laboratory. So I'll use an example that I've used in a number of my experimental studies where we have people do sentence unscrambles in order to prime certain concepts in their mind, and then we have them make choices thereafter, which is totally fine to do in the lab, but if my employer asked me to do a sentence at Scramble before I chose my 401k savings rate, I would frankly be pretty weirded out. Okay, so unnatural interventions are out when you're talking about policy, when you're talking about changing real life institutions. And finally, what we would like these, in, uh, these interventions to uh, have is this, this scalable property where I can extend it to a large number of people uh, without really causing the costs to explode. So I would consider an intervention that takes 10 minutes of time from a highly motivated person with a graduate degree to be not particularly scalable. And of course, there are lots of interventions that, that uh, do involve that. So we call you know, medical appointments to be you know, one such intervention. So I don't want to completely discount that genre of interventions, but it would be nice if we could find things that are really, really cheap to implement that we can just roll out to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people at very, very little incremental cost. I'm going to talk about three papers in this talk. Um, so two of those papers, the first two, are implementation intention prompt papers, and their joint work with Katie Milkman, uh, David Lapson, Bridget Madrian, and uh, John Bashirs. And the first paper was published in PNAS, second paper in preventive medicine. These are health-related uh, papers, and, and uh, they're going to be dealing with an older population, kind of 50 plus. And then the, the third paper is going to be an action cues paper a uh, joint work with Emily Hazley, Jennifer uh, Krakowski, and Cade Massey, uh, still in working paper form. You can find all these papers on my website, and all these papers are also uh, supported by the National Institute on Aging, so we're grateful to them uh, for their financial support. Also, uh, kind of, kind of a, a running theme to these papers is that I'm an economist, and there are economists on the author team, but there are also non-economists on the author team of each of these papers, so this is uh, uh, just an example of interdisciplinary work and what can come out of that. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with implementation intentions, uh, let me just define what that is. An implementation intention is a plan of the form, if situation X arises, then I will do Y. And these uh, implementation intention plans often consist of uh, specifying uh, when, where, and how I'm going to achieve my goal. And an implementation intentions prompt is, is uh, basically an encouragement to a recipient or a subject to form a plan of this form. The uh, first experiment I'm going to talk to you about uh, involves flu vaccination. The setting is a US utility firm, uh, and we work in partnership with them and eVive Health, which is a health communications firm to uh, send out mailings to about 3,300 employees who had indications for uh, flu vaccination. So they were either uh, 50 plus years old or they had some kind of chronic health condition that uh, increased the risk of flu complications. Uh, all of the employees in the sample uh, received a mailing about the flu vaccination and uh, yeah, it had information about where the flu vaccination was gonna happen at the work site and so on, and, and kind of the benefits of the flu vaccination. We randomized people into one of three conditions. Uh, so in this one page mailing, there was a box in the middle of the page that was prominently displayed, and the content of that box varied across conditions. In the control condition, this is what that box looked like. It just told you uh, where uh, that free flu shot clinic at the work site was going to happen. And, and that was all that was in that box. In the date plan condition, we added just a little bit of additional text to that box. Uh, the text reads, many people find it helpful to make a plan for getting their shot. You can write yours here. And we have three boxes below that uh, prompt you to put in the day of the week, the month, and the day that you're going to get your flu shot. In the time plan condition, we just add one more box where at the far right you have the time of day that you're going to get your flu shot. 
So very, very subtle and simple manipulation. Clearly, the marginal cost of implementing this treatment is zero, uh, except for the cost of a little bit of extra ink. Uh, and there was no mechanism uh, for collecting uh, these mailings. So it wasn't like uh, we were asking people to fill in a plan and then give it to somebody. If you wanted to throw away the mailing, you know, nobody would ever know except for you. So there was zero social pressure involved uh, in this intervention. And th the benefit of that is that this is very scalable because we don't need a real live person on the other end administering this treatment. The company kept track of who got a vaccination at the workplace, and so this is what we saw. In the control condition, 33% uh, of people uh, got the vaccination. In the date plan condition, remember that was where we just asked people to write down the date on which they planned to get their vaccine, get a little bit of an uptick, so we get 35.6% of people getting the vaccination at the work site. And then in the time plan condition where we asked people to make the most concrete and specific plan, we had the largest increase where 37.1% of people got the vaccination. So the way I think about these results is that for every 100 people who get the vaccination in the control condition, 112 people get the vaccination in the time plan condition. Now this is just vaccinations at the work site. And so a very natural and important question to ask is, are these actually new vaccinations that we're, uh, we're uh, creating, or are we just shifting vaccinations from outside the workplace to inside the workplace? For a subset of the population, we can actually track uh, vaccinations outside the workplace because they're in the PPO health plan rather than the HMO health plan. And so we can see vaccinations outside the workplace that were submitted for reimbursement claims to, uh, to the health insurance. So let's look at the PPO sample. Uh, very, very similar results uh, in the PPO sample where we get a 5.8 percentage point increase in workplace vaccinations if you are in the time plan condition versus the control condition. Now let's look at the treatment effect on all vaccinations in the workplace and outside the workplace. And what you can see is that uh, in the time plan condition, uh, you get a 5.7 percentage point increase in the rate of vaccinations anywhere and that 95% confidence interval you see on the graph uh, does not include zero. So that 5.7 percentage point treatment effect on all vaccinations is very similar to the 5.8 percentage point increase we saw in workplace vaccinations. So basically what we're seeing is that almost all of the additional vaccinations we're creating in the time plan condition uh, are truly new vaccinations. Another uh, interesting interaction that we found was a variation uh, in vaccination treatment effects, uh, depending upon whether your workplace offered the flu vaccine only on one day versus on multiple days. And so this is a, not a randomized comparison, and so we need to be a little careful about interpreting these results, but I think uh, it is interesting nonetheless that we find that there's a bigger treatment effect uh, on vaccinations in kind of both the workplace and outside the workplace for places where the flu vaccine was only offered on a single day uh, at the work site. And the way that you might think about this is that if an implementation plan that's uh, formed ahead of time uh, is more easily accessible, that means that your reaction time to an opportune moment is going to be faster, and that's going to be more advantageous if the opportune moment is more fleeting than if the opportune moment kind of lasts for an entire week, which is what the case at many of these multi-day clinics. So that's a, a flu vaccine. A flu vaccine is, is a relatively short, simple, not too unpleasant uh, task. What about more unpleasant uh, preventive behaviors, like say a colonoscopy? This is a, a study that uh, we uh, looked at involving 12,000 employees at four US companies, and they were included in the mailings because they were due for a colonoscopy under CDC guidelines. The median age here was uh, 58, and the mailings went out between June and August 2010. And we randomized people into one of two treatments. Treatment one was the control condition, where uh, people were told a uh, simple sticky note can really catch your eye. Uh, sticky notes, we use them to remember all sorts of trivial things. Why not use them to uh, uh, remind us of important things like colonoscopies? Uh, this is the percent of your colonoscopy cost that your company, um, your company covers. Uh, you know, go ahead and get a colonoscopy. And there's a sticky note uh, on the right-hand side that is blank. 
And the only difference between the control condition and the treatment condition is that in the treatment condition, that sticky note was not blank. We included the words, don't forget, colonoscopy appointment with blank on blank. And so the idea here is that you're prompting people with an implementation intentions plan of the where, when, and how uh, they might go about achieving this goal of getting a colonoscopy. We followed up uh, the actual response to these mailings by looking at insurance claims. So we look at colonoscopy rate by February 2011, which is about half a year after the mailings went out. And so what we find is that in the treatment condition, 7.2% of people end up getting a colonoscopy versus 6.2% of people in the control condition. In other words, a 16% relative increase. And so yes, implementation intentions do seem to have a positive effect, uh, even on procedures that are relatively unpleasant. Now I want to uh, move on to uh, talk about uh, action cues, where we're just going to focus on the second link uh, in this chain. And we're going to talk now about savings behaviors, uh, which is you know, a different uh, genre of action than health behaviors. But I think that there is a, a little bit of a psychological link in that if you're saving, then you're giving up current utility in order to achieve higher utility in the future. Same thing when you're engaging in preventive health behaviors or healthy behaviors in general, where it makes your present a little bit less pleasant, but hopefully the future will be brighter as a result. And this is also going to be a very different population. We're going to now be talking about people uh, mostly in their 20s and early 30s at a large technology company versus the 50 plus population that we were uh, dealing with before. So this was a, 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 an email study where we were emailing people at the company who were not on pace to max out the 401k contributions in the calendar year. And we randomized the content of the emails uh, that went out. So this is the kind of the baseline email. It came from the benefits director of the company. It said, Dear James, we want to remind you that the firm matches your qualified contributions, pre-tax and Roth, to the firm 401k plan, in other words, the firm will give you free money for saving in your 401k. And then the email described what the firm match was. It's a little bit complicated. Uh, the matching contribution is the greater of 100% of your qualified 2009 401k contributions up to 2,500, or 50% uh, of your qualified 2009 contributions up to 16,500 for a total possible match of 8,250. So $16,500 is the legal limit for how much you're allowed to contribute to a 401k plan on a before tax and Roth basis uh, in a single calendar year, at least uh, in, back in 2009. The amount has gone up a little bit since then. So this is an unusually uh, generous match because they're matching you all the way up to the legal limit. Most companies will only match you up to a lower threshold and will not match you all the way up to the maximum. And what this really means is that when we, people are changing the 401k contribution rates in this firm, it's affecting not just kind of their tax breaks and the, how much they're uh, taking advantage of uh, compound interest that's not taxed over time. It's having a real effect on uh, people's uh, accumulation today because the match is so generous, either 100% on the lower end or 50% uh, on each dollar on the upper end. And then the email uh, continued, where am I at right now? And tells you how much you've contributed to date then to take greater advantage of the firm's 2009 match, increase your contribution rate for the remaining six weeks of 2009. And then uh, if you were in a treatment condition, you would have one or two sentences inserted uh, right where the red text is there. If you were in the control condition, there was no text there. That's the only difference between the two emails. And then uh, there, there was just a, a coda on how practically you would increase your contribution uh, you would, you know, this, you go to your Vanguard website and uh, you know, click on this and click on that, and that's how it's done. I'm not going to uh, talk about every single cue that we uh, tested. I'm going to talk about a subset just in the interest of time. Uh, this is the lightest touch cue that we tested. We call this the uh, the anchor cues or the anchor treatments because we were trying to make the cues seem as arbitrary as possible in the spirit of and the, the classic psychological anchoring treatments uh, we've seen in the lab ever, you know, ever since the 70s with uh, Tversky and Kahneman. So the 1% anchor treatment inserted the following two sentences in that email. Uh, for example, 
you could increase your contribution rate by 1% of your income and get more of the match money for which you're eligible. 1% is just an example and shouldn't be interpreted as advice on what the right contribution increase is for you. This is also the lowest contribution queue that we implemented because the constraint was that everyone in the queues that we sent out had to have some reasonable ex ante chance of increasing contributions to the 401k because that was the goal of the firm. Um, and, and so this is kind of the, the lowest thing that we could really think of. So we think of this as a low queue. We also tried a 3%, 10%, 20% anchor treatment. For example, you could increase your contribution rate by 3% of your income, 10% of your income, 20% of your income. And then we follow people uh, after the email uh, using administrative 401k data from Vanguard. And this is the 1% anchor effect that I'm now gonna show you, uh, which we administered in 2009. What you have on the x-axis is the date, and on the y-axis is the difference between the 401k contribution rate that was in effect on the payday that you see on the x-axis minus the 401k contribution rate that was in effect right before the email went out. Okay, so these are basically changes that you're seeing, but they're not cumulative. It's just the difference at a point in time between uh, where you are right now and where you used to be before the treatment was administered. So let's start with the control line, which is not the blue line, but the thin black line. You can see that the email by itself looks like it had a pretty big effect where you see this big spike in contributions uh, from November 13th, uh, 13th all the way to the new year. And then you see this, this decay um, going all the way to March and then this big drop off after the first payday of March. Now this big drop off in contributions right after the new year is actually a seasonal pattern at this company. This company has an annual bonus that's paid in March. That's a very large percentage of annual compensation. And if your 401k contribution election was, say, 5%, then 5% of this very large, potentially very large bonus would go into the 401k plan, and people may or may not want that. And so people are, are kind of actively managing around this very salient deadline at this company. And so you, that, that's why you see every year uh, a little bit of a kind of a, a boom and a bust in contribution rates at January and then uh, kind of down at the bonus. Another thing I should mention is that at this company, they have auto escalation in contribution rates. If you have never made an active choice in your 401k plan, then they will bump you up by 1% of income in your contribution rate every January. And so you do see this bump up in January and then this uh, de decline right around the bonus. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in the background. So of course, we want to difference all that out, uh, which is why we have the control group. And then the treatment, the 1% anchor group, what you see is that their contribution rates are actually below the control group. And so you gave them a very low contribution rate increase anchor, and they increased their contributions less. And the difference is as large as 1.4% of income. Um, and then it persists uh, for almost a year after the email went out, and then uh, we're cutting off the graph at uh, the middle of October. Uh, another kind of surprising thing is that it does take a little bit of time for that anchor uh, to take effect, and uh, it's tempting to interpret this as uh, kind of a delayed response to the administration of an anchor, but you have to remember that this is not a laboratory study, so we don't have as much control as in the lab, so we don't know to what extent people are dosing themselves with the treatment again because they open the email later on because they want to change the 401k contribution rate. They remember, hey, there was this email that went out uh, that had directions on how to do that, so I'm going to open that up again in January, and you know, I get treated again. So I, I think that this is uh, you know, perhaps suggestive of a very long, uh, kind of a, a long delayed appearance of an anchor effect from in initial administration. Uh, consistent with that, but we can't uh, definitively prove that because we don't know when people are reading the emails. Another interesting thing is that you see that the uh, two lines converge right at the beginning of March when the bonus is paid, and so uh, it does look like there's this temporary uh, disappearance of the 1% anchor effect of the bonus, but then it reappears with a vengeance thereafter. And so it's not just about inertia uh, creating this 1% anchor effect uh, where people kind of move initially and then uh, you know, just leave it uh, forever, and that's why you see this big persistence of the treatment effect. Actually, people seem to be actively anchored 
for a very long time uh, at this lower contribution rate if they got this low savings queue. Now, uh, in 2009, we were only looking at the 1% anchor. In 2010, we got to run the experiment again. Uh, and so in 2010, we were able to administer the 3%, 10%, 20% anchor. And this is what we find. Actually, there's no difference in the average contribution rate uh, before the bonus period. But then after the bonus period, you see this big positive divergence between people who got the higher anchors and the control group. And that difference is as large as uh, you know, almost 2% of income. A couple surprises here. Um, surprise one is uh, that the 10%, 20% anchors uh, don't have a more positive effect than the 3% anchor, but actually there is some lab evidence on anchoring effects this, that might predict this kind of effect where very, very high anchors don't have a larger effect than moderately high, uh, high anchors. So Eric Johnson and, and, and a co-author uh, uh, have, have a paper from uh, you know, a few years back that show that. Other uh, surprise is, in fact, you know, the, the fact that um, there's no significant effect on average contribution rates early on in, in the sample period. And as we, we're kind of trying to figure out what's going on, a suggestive uh, outcome uh, that we look at is how likely is it that you have a different contribution rate in effect in a pay period than you had right before the email went out? And, it across the three anchors, it turns out that you are significantly less likely to make a change in your 401k contribution if you had uh, won these high anchors before the bonus, but then that difference uh, disappears in a statistical sense after the bonus is paid out. And so one interpretation is that if you receive this very high arbitrary anchor uh, in your email, it's a little bit discouraging and it causes you to disengage in the 401k temporarily, but then once the bonus is paid, you know, it's, it's less discouraging uh, to think about these very large contribution increases, and so then you see the gap in the uh, contribution rates average uh, really opening up. But, you know, that's, that's a kind of an ex post story. We certainly didn't expect this very delayed uh, treatment effect when we were running the experiment. Now let me talk about a different uh, uh, genre of cues. These are threshold treatments where we're going to make certain savings thresholds salient to people. So this is administered to people who are uh, very low savers, people who are on pace to con uh, contribute less than $3,000 for the year. And the $3,000 threshold treatment, we told people the next X dollars of contributions you make between now and December 31st will be matched at 100% rate. Remember, up to $3,000, actually, I didn't show you this slide, but in 2010, which is when this treatment was administered, uh, the matching formula changed a little bit, and so contributions up to $3,000 in the year were matched at 100% rate. And so we're just going to tell you how far away are you from uh, the point at which you um, that the 100% incentive is is phasing out. Okay, so the next X dollars of contributions you make between now and December 31st will be matched at 100% rate, or uh, we highlight the $16,500 threshold. We just tell you contributing Y dollars more, where Y is the distance between where you are now and the maximum possible contribution, $16,500. Uh, that's going to earn you uh, uh, the maximum possible match if you uh, contribute that Y dollars. And so either highlighting that close threshold or that far threshold, a low Q or a high Q in the savings. What we find is that initially, people who receive these two cues have the same contribution rate, then this uh, big difference opens up after the new year where the people who receive the $3,000 threshold cue seem to have gotten satisfied at achieving a lower level of savings and they kind of drop off the cliff in their contribution rates, whereas you see much more persistence at a higher contribution rate for people who had the high dollar threshold cue. And so again, we see that high cues are engendering higher savings, low cues are engendering lower savings. And that difference is uh, as large as 1.5% of income. The final set of uh, cues I'm going to talk about are uh, goal cues. So we administered two different uh, goal cues. One was the $7,000 goal treatment. The other was the $11,000 goal treatment. So this was administered to people who were on pace to contribute between $3,000 and $6,000 uh, 
uh, for the calendar year. And so the $7,000 goal treatment was higher, or the $7,000 savings goal was higher than what they would have otherwise uh, been on pace for if they didn't make any change at all. But it was not kind of a hugely a higher number for many of these people. So we just tell them, for example, suppose you set a goal to contribute $7,000 for the year and you attained it, you'd earn X dollars more in matching money this year than you're currently on pace for. Versus, for example, suppose you set a goal to contribute $11,000 for the year and you attained it, you would earn Y dollars more in matching money uh, this year than you're currently on pace for. Okay, so all of this information is already in the control email. We're just uh, kind of repackaging it a little bit. And here's the result where in the green is people who received the $11,000 goal and thin black line is the control group and then the blue line is the $7,000 goal group. So you can see that the blue line and the control line are uh, never statistically significantly different from each other. So having a low goal made salient to you doesn't uh, have much of an effect at all on your savings rates, but if you have the high goal the $11,000 goal, then you have a bigger spike in your contribution rate. And that spike is as large as 2.2% of income before it does, it does die away once you get to that bonus period and people readjust. So just to sum up, um, what I've talked about is a series of decision cues that reduce the cognitive cost of going from an opportune situation to acute action, and that can take the form of prompting an entire implementation intention plan where I both prompt the occasion of acting and then what action you might take, or we uh, have also looked at just action cues that don't prompt you on what, uh, when you're going to take the action, but it does make salient a particular action that you would take conditional upon deciding to act, and that, uh, I would argue, kind of greases the wheels towards uh, making that particular choice when you do decide to act. Uh, I think that a few attractive features of the cues that uh, we've studied are that they are low cost, um, zero cost, I would argue. Uh, they're scalable uh, and they have large effects on outcomes. And so I do think that uh, further uh, exploration of decision cues in, in uh, the field outside of the laboratory is a, a promising avenue for uh, creating behavior change. I'll stop there. Great. Thank you, very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask uh, about the um, retirement contribution studies, and in particular, I'm wondering about framing effects and um, what we know about how uh, those kinds of behavioral changes might be influenced by the way you frame the retirement contribution. So in your studies, you frame them as the current savings, um, which is kind of a, perceived as, in a way, a, a loss in the moment. Um, the implication, though, is that there's some potential gain in the future that people are, are delaying their you know, current income for some benefit in the future. And, and has, has anyone looked at, or do you have any thoughts about how that kind of behavior might be influenced by emphasizing in the message what the outcome down the road might be and how, how appealing that would be for them in terms of making the small contribution now? So if you, if you increase by 2% now, you're going to have another you know, $500,000 when you retire if you make this small change now. Um, and if anyone's looked at that as a, as a mechanism of, of trying to influence people's choices in the moment. Yeah, so um, you know, there, there, there are certainly lots of studies on gain versus loss framing. Uh, off the top of my head, at this moment, I'm, I can't think of something that, uh, of a study that specifically looked at gain versus loss framing in the savings domain, as you're suggesting. Maybe some people in the audience have, have seen something like that, and, and I don't exclude the possibility that these studies exist, uh, just they're not coming to mind right now. I do think that in the uh, in the study that I described to you, there is a bit of a gain element that's included because we are talking about this whole thing in the context of gaining more match money. Right? So it's not just a, a loss uh, of your current consumption. It's you're, you're immediately getting this very, very large uh, immediate risk-free return on your savings, which may have helped the study along or the, helped the cues along. Um, 
Um, have you looked at whether the, the size of these effects behaved um, uh, according to age? So if you are you know, 25, you might want to put your savings into a house rather than in retirement. And if you are five years away from retirement, you might feel that it's too late. So these effects might be much larger and the intervention might be much larger if you target the right group. Have you looked at those kinds of effects? Yeah, so unfortunately at this particular company, uh, there's really not much variation in age. So if you're like 35, you're actually pretty old at this company, even though it's, it's pretty large. Um, now, in the uh, health, uh, the health uh, domain studies that we looked at, um, it, the evidence was a little bit conflicting. So in the flu shots context, there was actually no interaction with age or any of the other demographics we saw in the treatment effect. In the colonoscopy study, we did actually see that people who were older uh, um, we act, had a bigger treatment effect to the implementation intentions prompt. I think it's a little bit hard to interpret exactly what that effect is, or where that interaction is coming from. Is it the fact that these prompts are more powerful for older adults, or is it that older adults are more likely to uh, read their mail? And, and so once you go outside of the laboratory, you do lose a little bit of that tight control over mechanisms that you have in the lab, although you, know, you do get insight into how, whether these things work in practice, which I think you know, is equally important. So I think it's an interesting uh, area to explore further about you know, how these, how the psychological mechanisms uh, vary by, age, the strength of the psychological mechanisms vary by age, but then in the real world, that's always going to interact with how successful are you at distributing the treatment? And I think that, that could be quite context specific. So one of the things that seems to be a characteristic of all psychological interventions is is they diminish over time, and um, and so you know like if you do psychotherapy for for anxiety and people get a little bit better and then over time they they aren't much different from controls and um, I was wondering about what your thoughts are about booster shots because <laughs> you have a lot of these effects that really diminish over time and is there a, is there a science of when to boost, how to boost, um, and uh, and do you, and is it just the same thing that you do per? Yeah. So um, the the limited evidence I can bring to bear here is that we did run the study at this at this company with this, the four hundred and one k in two successive years, and so many of the people who were exposed in the second year had received an email in the first year. Um, now, what we haven't looked at is the particular interactions between you know, what treatment did you experience in the first year versus the second year, because the cell sizes get pretty small in that case. But uh, we are seeing these you know, fairly large effects even in the second year. And so I think that that does support this notion of a booster shot. Uh, we also see big positive reactions to that reminder email in each year. So the, the kind of the reaction of the control group itself, I think, is interesting. And, and you don't really see a uh, drastic diminishment of that reminder in the second year. In fact, the, when we sent these emails out in the first year, 2009, uh, those reminder emails were very popular among the employees. And they emailed HR and said, you know, this is fantastic that you're reminding us. This is one of the reasons why I love working at this company. How come you didn't send these out earlier in the year? And so the, the following year, we sent it out in October rather than November. And my understanding is that this is just a regular practice of the company now where towards the end of the year, they will send out an email saying, hey, this is you know, kind of the 401k match. This is how much you contributed so far. Uh, and they use the cues that we've tested here, uh, segmenting by uh, kind of um, by, by group, because these cues were administered to different subsets of the population at the company. Uh, so I, th I think that there, there is a role for booster shots. And there's a kind of a more ambitious research agenda we see, do people develop some kind of immunity to these shots where, uh, you know, after a while, you just stop tuning, the, uh, start tuning them out. Um, it, it's a much more ambitious research agenda to have that longitudinal study. And, and that's the technology of that, designing the optimal reminder and without desensitizing people or, you know, irritating them, that's basically an unexplored there aren't a set of principles that we, that one could draw on in, uh, for in economics or 
I mean, I, I think that there, you know, I would rely upon introspection at this point rather than uh, actual evidence. These, I mean, these reminders were going out once per year, so I think that the scope for uh, kind of irritation was pretty limited. If these were going out every month, then I think that the spam filters would start uh, kicking in a little bit. But yeah, you know, we, we uh, talked with this company for a while, and, and maybe this will happen at some point, about optimal nagging uh, strategies. Uh, you know, how often should you nag somebody to do something? How close to the deadline should you nag people? Um, so we may, may do that. I think that a challenge with that study was uh, thinking about how, how general would the result be? Would it be uh, nagging, you know, would, would certain nags be more effective for a certain class of behaviors, but not others, and how would you study that in a very general way? I think it's very challenging. But you know, hugely interesting to all of us who would like people in our lives to do different things. Uh, you know, I, I wonder about that myself often. Um, thank you very much. I was curious about your goal setting effect, and um, I was wondering if you looked at all um, at kind of people's proximity um, toward um, toward the goal already. So, um, kind of uh, going off of the idea of this goal gradient hypothesis, so that um, people are uh, going to be kind of more willing to expend more effort the closer they already are. Yeah. So, I mean, what the, the way we thought about that actually was through the randomization of how close the goal was. So were you, were you given the $7,000 goal versus the $11,000 goal? And we did see that people responded more to the $11,000 goal prompt. And it, we saw no evidence that people kind of became discouraged by at least the $11,000 goal, where we measured discouragement by the probability that you made any change at all. Right? So you did see higher average savings change and no diminishment in the probability of doing doing so. So that's, you know, in that context, it did seem that the further away the goal was, uh, kind of the, the bigger the response. There, the uh, one uh, cue that I didn't talk about, uh, you know, in, in the presentation also speaks a little bit to this, where we were highlighting the maximum possible contribution rate uh, at the company, which was 60% of income in a given pay period. So, so the cue was uh, simply, you can contribute up to 60% of your income in a given pay period. That, that, that was it. And what we found was that people who had very, very low contribution rates, so 0%, 1%, actually had a huge positive response to the 60% Q. But then if you had a higher contribution rate, you basically had a zero response. And so there was this kind of positive interaction between how far away that highlighted kind of goal or threshold was and, and uh, the, the effect on your savings. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for the for the interesting presentation. I have a question about the colonoscopy study. Um, so there, you're really focusing on boosting implementation intentions and assuming that people ha already have um, the intention to do that procedure. And 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 it's an unpleasant procedure that um, can really have huge benefits. So we know that colon cancer is um, they develop very slowly so that when they are caught, they are really um, very fatal in a lot of instances because they are being caught so late. So that this is one of the cancer types where there is a huge benefit to being screened earlier. So I'm wondering um, whether including some of that information, you know, not targeting implementation intentions, but intention formation, um, what your thoughts would be on how, the, how, how that would affect um, actually um, the this, this screening rates and, and this, this kind of setting. So I think that there are probably people in this room that are much more qualified to uh, talk, talk about the effects of scare tactics uh, in public health uh, uh, than I am. I'm, I'm more of a dabbler in the field. My understanding is that there's not a huge amount of evidence that scare tactics are, are particularly effective, but I'm more than willing to be corrected by somebody in the audience who actually reads this stuff for a living. Thank you. I'm right. I like being right. So I want to pick up on that theme some more, not in any way to imply scare tactics, but I think this idea of considering the affective dimension of cues and getting back to, to Bob's 
point about is there some configuration of optimal cues, um, this idea that, um, I mean, if you think about your metaphors, greasing the wheels and nagging, those have affective components. You're making something feel easier or, or tracking along this way um, in some you know, intuitive sense for an individual. And nagging has a pretty negative connotation. You're being nagged to do something you don't want to do or scared. And so I think this idea of how do you activate positive motivational affective systems in a nudge-like way, and we tend to focus on the cognitive part, give them information, give them uh, you know, <clears throat> you know, the monetary incentives. But I think there's a really rich uh, you know, literature looking at cues and craving and po positive, appetitive, appetite-based, goal-based systems. So I'm wondering if people are doing some creative approaches to thinking about tapping into these affective systems in more strategic ways, not just to scare people, but in thinking about the greasing the wheels or not pulling people towards something they want uh, and activating those tendencies, even in small ways, rather than just the information. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, the studies I can think of uh, that may most directly tap into these act affective uh, processes um, are, are in this kind of gain-loss framing. framing. And so not the, the nudges that I've, I've uh, presented, which are actually all, I would say, positive-framed nudges, because they're all framed in the, in the sense of, you know, this is how much more match you could get if you did such and such. Um, there are these uh, field experiments that look at, you know, do you give workers a bonus if they perform versus do you tell workers, you've earned this, but if you don't perform, we're going to take it away. And if I recall correctly, uh, saying that uh, if you uh, that we're going to take it away is actually more effective at motivating productivity than giving stuff as a bonus. My understanding also is that these gain loss manipulations um, they don't always seem to work. So sometimes you get null effects, and and uh, so I th think that the reliability of those treatments is is a little bit up in the air right now. Um, but you know I, I think. Uh, yeah, kind of exploring further, you know, what affective systems work best for these nudges or these or these uh, nags. I think it's very interesting. I was reading some article, some pop journalism article a while back about how uh, animal trainers always use only positive reinforcement in order to get their animals to jump through hoops and do all sorts of crazy things, and they just ignore uh, bad behavior and suggestion was that we can do the same thing with the people in our lives, that, that we just give positive affirmation for good behaviors and just ignore the bad behaviors, and that's much more effective at creating behavior change. I don't know if that's ever been done in humans, uh, but it seems to work for uh, killer whales and seals and, and such. Thank you. Really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you have any suggestions or learnings that uh, might apply for the, type, the best types of interventions for behavior change that is not a sort of a one-shot, I'm going to change my investment, or that, that pertains to sort of um, repetitive behaviors that people have to adopt over time to have a, a positive outcome. Yeah, so if, if we had ever, I, I don't know if at some point we're having a panel discussion where we discuss the kind of the huge, uh, kind of the, you know, the holy grails uh, of behavior change. And I think that exactly what you mentioned is, is one of them. How, all of the stuff that I presented is on these one-time uh, actions that you want people to just get over that one hurdle and then you're pretty happy. I think the, really the huge challenge and, and, and where I think the most gain is uh, potentially there is for these repeated behaviors. And I don't think that we have a great way of, um, of addressing that. So things like medication adherence, huge public health problem. Uh, ha you know, the challenge is kind of every day or three times a day. And I think uh, we have had very, very little success in affecting those behaviors because the stuff that we do, uh, that we have tried, they just wear off pretty quickly. So whether we pay people, to, well, if you pay people to take their pills, then they'll take the pills, but only while you're paying them. And once you stop paying them, it seems like the effect pretty much disappears. And, I don't know if we want to be in the business of paying people to take their pills for the rest of their lives. It's pretty expensive. Um, or you know, glow caps, where you know, the, the pill cap will tell you you should take your pill now, and it glows and beeps and bothers you. I, I think that after a while, people just turn the stuff off or ignore it. And, and uh, 
And so again, that's, that's a, an example where actually people do kind of tune out that nudge after a while. And, and so, yeah, I, I think it's a huge challenge. Uh, who, whoever solves that problem should be you know, a superhero and, and, and treated as such. I have both a question and a comment, and I'll start with the comment first. And this is to uh, reflect back on my colleague from Urbana. The, um, in studying older adults, there is incredible diversity of people over 50. Um, and that diversity is a lot about time, a lot about money. And so I would urge you, when you say everybody over 50, um, I think that there's a lot of diversity to plumb there around what would be reasons or motivations or intentions. So comment. The question is, are you looking at gender? One of the things in any of the studies, uh, because one of the things we've encountered, we're looking at adult learners and discovering that 70, 75 percent of adult learners are women. And so we've begun to do focus groups and other things with men to find out what's keeping them outside the classroom. And one of the things that reflects positively on what you've said is when we give men one date, one time, they come. <laughs> if you give them multiple days and multiple times, they're less likely to come. But that's not a part of our study, but that's just our practice. So I'm interested, is there any gender difference in any of the studies that you've done? So in the technology company, uh, we don't have gender information, although I presume that it's, it's a heavily male population, as many technology companies are. Uh, but, but we have not looked at that dimension there because we don't have that data. Uh, in the uh, flu shot study, I believe, if I recall correctly, that there was no gender interaction in the treatment effect. Uh, but in the colonoscopy study, I think that the men responded more, uh, to the tr more positively to the treatment than the women did. Uh, I'd have to go, go look at the paper again to, to be 100 percent sure. Uh, but I do believe that there was that interaction there. But again, it's a little hard to interpret because is it that the men read the mail more or is it that the men actually respond more to this particular psychological intervention? I, one of the areas that I would love to have a nuanced discussion about during the, these two days is uh, you know, I'm an economist, and when I sort of talk to my sort of psychology colleagues or sort of those who don't know psychology very well, but they, they want to discuss some intervention that uses some kind of nudges, particularly if it involves money, and they always, uh, you know, people talk about, well, what about the intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation? And that's sort of a, a very sort of crude distinction. And I think we could have a much more nuanced conversation here over the next couple of days. So this is a question I want to ask many, many speakers about, but what can we learn about anything about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation from this particular application. And it's a little bit different because you're potentially having sort of one-time behavior change uh, that, 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 that could stick. But is there anything that, that, that you can speak to here about whether these sort of one-time bonuses are actually potentially having some negative impact later? Or if one group gets a, a bonus and some other group observes it but doesn't get the bonus, I, whether you know, there were any features of that in this, this study that, that we could learn from. Yeah, so in, in these studies, there, was no, uh, there were no bonuses of money. So I don't think that the studies are well suited to uh, studying uh, issues of extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation because the, at least the monetary bonuses, when there were any, were the same across all individuals because they were all facing the same 401k match. And in the colonoscopy study and, and the flu shot study, there was no uh, money that changed hands. So I, I think it's, it's an, kind of an interesting uh, discussion to be had. I'm not sure that the current studies are, are well suited to studying that. Now, there's this other question of if we get nudged and we expect to get nudged in the future, does that have deleterious effects in the future on the effort that we uh, expend on saving or health behaviors or whatever, at least in uh, the saving study, we don't see any kind of a rebound effect in that, you know, initially you save more and then later on you save less. We, we don't see that, that sort of thing. I, I guess I also want to make a broader point about uh, this fear that nudges are going to infantilize us and cause us to, you know, 
stop paying attention to our lives and, and so on. And I think that uh, you know, there's another uh, a kind of very important driver of economic development that we call division of labor that also has similar features where we give up expertise in, uh, in a certain area and we expend less effort in that area. And so I don't know how to fix my car because a mechanic does it for me. And is that infantilizing? Yeah, you know, I guess I'm not as much of a man because I can't fix my car and I've never changed the oil in my car. But I, I would argue that we're better off as a society when I can offload certain things to other people. And so I, I think that you have to discuss nudges in the context of why is this so much worse than division of labor and specialization? And clearly, you know, when we specialize and we divide labor, something is lost, no doubt. Uh, but I think a lot is gained as well. All right, let's have lunch. <laughs>